Juan Miro is celebrated as one of the greatest modern artists for his abstract surrealist paintings and sculpture. However, it took years to develop his personal style. The following presentation will focus on the farm, a painting which many consider to be a pivotal piece in his career. I will explain Miro's background and some artists that influenced him. I will discuss how these experiences transpired into different aspects of the farm. I will examine some of the symbology in the farm. And lastly, I will explain how the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. came to be in its possession. Juan Miro was born in Montreux, Spain in 1893. Montreux is a small town in northeast Spain in a region known as Catalonia. The Catalonians have a strong cultural heritage rich in the arts. Miro attended the School of Fine Arts in Barcelona in 1907. He studied under Urgal Inglada, who, as a landscape painter, had a great influence on him. He left painting for two years and then returned to the Academy of Galli in Barcelona in 1912. This school was less structured than the first. They taught the great masters, but they also concentrated on ancient Catalonian art and emphasized the importance of poetry and music. In 1915, Miro left school and began his career. He produced landscapes, portraits, and still lifes. In 1919, he took his first trip to Paris and was introduced to his fellow Catalonian, although not by birth, he was seven when his family moved to the area, Pablo Picasso. Miro then began a cycle of winters in Paris and summers in Montreuil. He began the farm in 1921 in Montreuil and finished it in Paris in 1922. It took him nine months of working seven to eight hours a day to complete it. The painting is a realistic, detailed picture of Miro's family farm. Looking at the farm, one can see the influences on Miro. The landscape itself is reminiscent of his teacher, Urgell, with its long horizontal line cutting the picture in half. The painting is stylistically similar to the frescoes seen in the churches of Barcelona with its heavy outlines of the objects. It is also simplistic. This feature is due to the influence of Catalonia folk art as well as his love of Henri Rousseau's primitive art. The colors are very Spanish, like those seen in the works of the great Spanish masters, El Greco, Velasquez, and Goya, but they are also bright and bold like the fogs. The shifting perspective is decisively due to the influence of Cezanne. Some objects are seen frontally while others are viewed from above. For example, the snail in the foreground is frontal, but the lizard next to him is drawn as if we are looking down on him. Also, the rooster is seen frontally, while the water trough he is standing on is seen from above. The geometric forms, triangles, and the newspaper with the letters L-I-N-T-R are from Miro's cubist exposure. When Miro was asked to comment on the farm, he described it being just a physical representation of his family's farm in Montreuil. I quote, the painting was absolutely realistic. I didn't invent anything. I only eliminated the fencing on the front of the chicken coop because it kept you from seeing the animals, unquote. However, this has not stopped art historians from analyzing the meaning of Miro's picture. Maria Joseph Balsach, a professor of contemporary art in Catalonia, Spain, believes that Miro painted the Arma Christi, which are objects representing Christ's defeat against Satan, death, and sin in the golden area in front of the chicken coop to signify Miro's own rebirth into another realm of painting. These include the ladder, the rooster, and the golden grain. Because of Miro's strong Catalonian heritage, it is a plausible theory. Other objects of rebirth include the eucalyptus tree, the tree of life, the baby, which is shaded dark to light in the spirit of going from darkness to light, a metaphor again meaning a change in Miro's painting, and the rabbits in the chicken coop. Another art historian, Janice Fink, interpreted the farm as a story of fertility. The water can in the foreground of the picture with the newspaper L-I-N-T-R, which is translated into the word into, is Miro's way of symbolically painting the male's reproductive organ. She also notes the path which leads in the background to figures of a woman and a baby and the obvious tree of life in the center of the painting, which are meant to represent fertility. Lastly, I will tell the story of how the farm got to the National Gallery of Art. After Miro painted the farm, he tried to sell it. He took it to various art dealers but had no luck. By chance, Ernest Hemingway was visiting the studio next door to Miro's and saw the piece. Finally, a man named Evan Shipman decided to buy it. He told Hemingway his intent, and Hemingway declared that he had seen it and wanted it. 
They flipped a coin. Shipman won, but Hemingway was so distraught, he let him have it. Hemingway, after scraping the money for the last payment, gave it to his first wife, Hadley, as a birthday present. When Hadley and Hemingway divorced, she kept the painting until years later when Hemingway asked to borrow it. Hemingway brought it to his own farm in Cuba. In 1959, the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, contacted him to borrow it for an exhibition they were having on Miro. After much difficulty, due to the political problems in Cuba, the farm arrived badly damaged, mostly from the moisture in Cuba to New York. It was restored for $1,500, which was billed to Hemingway. This outraged Mary, Hemingway's fourth wife. In 1961, Hemingway committed suicide and MoMA still had the painting. After five years of legal dispute with Hadley, Mary got the painting back. In 1976, Mary loaned the farm to the National Gallery of Art and when she died in 1986, bequeathed it to them.